The revolution that we need is a revolution of righteousness in the lives of believers, and indeed around the world, whether a person's a believer or not, they need to come to Christ. But today, we seldom hear very much preaching along the lines of what I preached on last week, which was the fact that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account for the deeds that done in our bodies and also the thoughts that we've had and every single word that we've spoken. Uh, normally what we hear is God loves you unconditionally, which I'm glad that he does. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it almost, you seldom hear repentance, very much stress, uh, confession, repentance, living a uh, life of contrition and a life that's lived for Christ. But that was what I keyed on last week. But I want to sort of finish up where I was uh, last, uh, last Sunday morning. And this, so this would be, you say you want a revolution part two. And this was in the, the basement over at the church and they put the um, drywall up on the ceiling. That's part of the uh, fire code. And so uh, two fellows did that and uh, they weren't very big guys, but they were pretty strong. They, they hanging that stuff up overhead and I watched them for a little while. I watched them until, you know, they start getting irritated then I leave. <laughs> We're going to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 today. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. There's coming a day when the earth will be remade. The heaven that now is will be remade. And the former things the things that have happened in our lives, the present realities, will be realities no more. Last week we talked about the fact that societal issues and issues of sin um, in, our, in our nation, around our world, in our personal lives, they are present with us today. They also have a future because there will be a judgment, but then after that there will be a time when all those things are washed away and they're not remembered anymore. It is sobering to think of our accountability to God personally and societally. We have a present and a future. It doesn't do any good to lie to people. People will be judged for their deeds and on their faith at the end of their lives and the end of time when God ushers in the eternal state. The manner of judgment is not as important as our understanding that it will happen. Now the reason I say that is because there is some disagreement among people that uh, spend much time studying eschatology and uh, on exactly how many judgments there will be. And some folks have it broken down that there's seven different judgments and there are three different judgments and that's not as important as the fact that we understand we're going to stand before God and every deed of our lives will be laid bare and judged. Our faith will be judged, but our actions will also be judged. Christians are to live a certain way. Now, just to be honest, there is some room for interpretation when you speak of living a Christian life. And there's some things that not everybody's going to agree with, every detail, but the main things about good, clean, moral living are pretty clear in the Scripture because you find them over and over and over again. Which brings up a good point. We need to base the, uh, our belief and the aspects of our faith on things in Scripture that are the most clear. There's some things mentioned in Scripture, just mentioned a time or two. But things like the love of God are just about seen on every page, at least in some way. Things like the holiness and righteousness of God are very common in the Scripture. Things like how people are supposed to treat each other 
we find mentioned over and over and over again in the scripture. And on those things we base our faith because they're relatively clear. Now, having said that, the Bible is deliberately nonspecific on some things. Now, there are verses in the Bible that say, put your faith in Christ and your salvation is secured and your salvation is on your faith and not based on your works. And so uh, there have been some people that have perverted that type of teaching to almost the place where they say, well, I have faith, it just doesn't matter what I do. <coughs> but there are other verses in the scripture that say, by the way, if you're a liar, you're not going to heaven. If you're sexually immoral, you're not going to heaven. See, the teaching is that if a person is genuinely a child of God, they live a certain way. And there's areas in which we all miss it. None of us have everything exactly right, but we're supposed to be in the process. We're supposed to be developing as the children of God or else we're probably not Christians at all. But the Bible is deliberately nonspecific on an issue like how far can a person go in sin without losing their faith? Make no mistake, sinful behaviors have a devastating effect on faith. And there is not a line that I can decipher where I can say to someone, you go this far, there's no hope for you. But the Bible seems to indicate that that line is there. Why is it nonspecific? Because God wants us to focus on living for him and not exactly where the line of every fall is. So the Bible is deliberately nonspecific on some things. The Bible is also nonspecific on how unbelief in certain biblical on certain biblical issues affects our faith as far as in a salvation context. Listen, there are all manner of Christians today, people that say they're Christians, that they'll say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm saved, and but I don't think that this in the Bible is true. Even though the Bible presents it as being true, I don't believe it. The first chapters of Genesis, they're all myths. I actually read within the last probably six months, someone who said that, well, obviously, we don't believe that Jesus, the account of Jesus walking on the water was literal. Because people can't walk on water. Now, this is a person that claimed to be a Christian. Is it easier for you to believe that Jesus walked on water or that Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus? There are all manner of folks that say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that. Be careful when you start doubting your Bible. Tony Campolo who is a progressive Christian. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the name. And by progressive, what we mean is a liberal Christian that has a lot of doubts about some of the veracity of many things in the scripture, but claims to be a Christian. His son, Bart, is an atheist. Bart Campolo said, doubting the Bible is addictive because when you cast out on one thing, it affects how you view another thing. So be careful. The Bible, though, is deliberately nonspecific on how far we can go in sin without losing faith. It's nonspecific on how belief on every biblical representation affects our faith in the salvatory manner. I want to follow up with a couple of things today in the light of the fact that we are all going to stand before God and give account of every aspect of our lives. And the first thing is, the best Christians fail. 
I grew up in church as many of you did. I know that would not be true of every individual, but I've been in church all my whole life, just since I was a little bit. Um, I sort of got the idea that as far as people that were Christians and serving the Lord and wanted to do the right thing, that a lot of the things that were listed in the Bible that people could do that were abhorrent in the eyes of God, that a lot of those things among professing Christian people, they might happen once in a while, but they're really, really rare. I mean, the only thing people that say they're Christians would be maybe once in a while they told a little bit, you know, wasn't too serious, just a, just a little, what we call a white lie, you know, maybe somebody did something once in a while, but it didn't happen often. What I have come to realize having grown into adulthood and having been a pastor for 40 years is that Christians fall into sin all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. You may remember one of the uh, instances that Paul uh, brought forth where he said, it's been reported that there's a sin among you folks in the church and it is such a sin as is not even named among the heathen. And I want to tell you, without much fear of contradiction, there are some fine, fine people that have some devastating things in their past. That's what the blood of Christ is for. But the idea that once we profess faith in Christ and we get in church and we come pretty well most of the time and we're kind of active, that we're not really going to be faced with the same problems, that is absolutely not true. And really, I never met anybody that seemed to think you wouldn't be faced with the problems. But I've had a lot of people that seem to think that you probably wouldn't have much trouble with the problems, and that is not true. Devastating sins are committed and have been committed by people who genuinely love God. Put people in the right circumstance. Maybe it's their fault they're in that circumstance. But you'd be surprised at some of the things you've In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is speaking of Old Testament Israel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. A couple of things there. Sin has always been around and it has always been common. And Paul has listed uh, several things that happened in the Old Testament Israel. And he said, these are examples for you guys that are living now. And by the way, if you think you stand, then be careful that you don't fall. And then he says, be careful, but there is hope. You know, occasionally a Christian will fall into sin, and they'll make it right, and then they'll quit church because they feel so ashamed. You know, I... I kind of understand that in a way. I mean, why would you want to come somewhere and be embarrassed all the time? You know, I can, so I can kind of understand that, but that's not what the church is for. There are some good people that have done some bad things. 
in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let me say it again. The sin that so easily entangles. Now, while I've been a Christian and I've made a little bit of uh, progress in maturity and everything, listen, the devil won't have much trouble with you. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now why does the Bible say don't grow weary and lose heart? Because that would be a natural response to having a lot of trouble in life. But the Bible says, look at, look at Jesus. If you look around at other people, you'll be disappointed in them. If you look only at yourself, you'll be disappointed in yourself. And that's why the Bible says, look to Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, you who labor and are heavy and laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Jesus didn't say, if you're weak and burdened down, come to me and I will tell you how it ought to be. Come to me for your whipping. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. I am gentle, is what meek means. And you find rest if you come to me. We're always talking about being confessional, confessing our sins. You know, the Bible says to confess to one another and pray for each other, and we'll be forgiven, and God will heal, and and all the rest of that. I'm, I'm telling you what, just based on experience, there's some folks you don't want to know your sins. <laughs> They'll be the little fool out of you. <laughs> you you will never recover from what they will do to you. But that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. He's gentle. And you find rest. Why would I want to go somewhere that they're going to treat me harshly? I wouldn't want that. So don't lose heart. Sin anger easily entangles, and there are many hindrances, but other people have overcome, so be patient. That verse, that text says, there's a great cloud of witnesses. There have been plenty of other people that have been through the difficulties that we're going through today, and they overcame it. And so look at Jesus for a good example. You see, devastating sins are committed by people who genuinely love God. But God forgives our sins when we repent. And repent means to change and go a different direction. Repentance and confession, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. Because confession can't just be admission, but repentance implies a change. I was going one way, now I'm going another way. I've repented of my sins. You will remember the tragic, tragic case of uh, uh, Stacy Peterson from several years ago. You will remember that her husband got involved in a relationship with a woman named Amber Fry, and uh, Amber did not know he was married. Of course, he was in concealing that from her. And she was very open, upfront, and quick to come to the forefront and say, I didn't know about what had happened. And I remember watching her as she was there before the news people and some others and on camera being broadcast around the nation. And she stood there and the tears ran down her cheek as she told what had happened from her revolver. And somebody from the crowd said, yeah, but you had 
an affair with a married man and she said but I repented you don't hear that you don't hear that you hear plenty of people say well, well I'm sorry about that but she said what the Bible says I repented Bible says when we repent that God forgives our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. John. Amen. David said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's in Psalm 51, which is his repentance psalm for his sin with Bathsheba and surrounding Uriah. And he wrote this down as a song, and they sang it throughout the nation. And he said, God, I don't have a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart and make me right again. God will forgive our sins. And the Bible says our sins and iniquities, he doesn't remember anymore. What that means is he doesn't hold them against us. Because that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not forgetting that something happened. Forgiveness is not holding against someone. <laughs> forgiveness is when you give up the desire for revenge. Every single person here can recall something in the past of how something serious happened between you and another person and now you're just great friends and when you think of it, you laugh. Why? Because you don't hold it against each other. That means you've forgiven it. As long as you're holding things against people, you've not forgiven that thing. And that's hard for you, and may not, just to be honest, be possible for you. And you need to pray about that and ask God to help you with it, but it's possible with God. But the best Christians fail. Remember that. Secondly, the vilest sinners repent. It's always been interesting to me what seems to pan out what doesn't? There are folk that they'll come to church and they'll seem like the real deal. I mean, it's like they walk in and take over the place. And I'm 100% for people being involved. I mean, every church is just begging for folks to be really active and everything. I'm 100% for that, but, and, and lo and behold, after a few weeks, you know, folks are saying, where's those ones up? And then there's the other side where you be witnessing to a person and in faith evangelism we use what is called the key question. You ask them the key question, they want to receive Christ and they say yes and it's almost like you say, really? <laughs> and they'll be the very ones that will manifest a repentance and a change don't prejudge the fruit. Paul considered himself the worst of sinners. In the book of 1 Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I wrote that verse on one of the studs over here in Churchville. My wife gave me a little framed copy of that verse, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, our Lord who's enabled me. He changed me around. I used to be a violent man. I used to blaspheme God, and I persecuted the church. But I confess my unbelief and my ignorance, and God forgave me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You used to be one way, but you were washed. And you're not that way anymore. Repentance involves recognition. We have to come face to face with our sins. We have to confront them. The scripture picturing Jesus death on the cross. And one of the mild factors which were hanged railed on him saying if thou be Christ save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying does not thou fear God seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we have been justly well, we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me. You have to repent with all you have. This man only had just a short time to live. But he believed who Jesus was. He believed in his sinless and vicarious death. And he also believed in who he was. He said to the other man who cursed and cast dispersions in the face of Jesus, he said, don't you fear God? You and me are getting what we deserve. But he's not done anything. And he did not have a Bible and probably couldn't read. If he did, only about 20% of the Roman Empire could read. But he believed Jesus. And Jesus said, we're going to think. And he had wasted an entire lifetime but salvation is by grace. The best Christians fail. The vilest sinners repent and the sacrifice of Christ satisfies. Scripture is replete with the message that sin is death. God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit of this tree because in the day that you eat it, you're going to die. Now what they always used to say, preachers in my growing up, most of my recollection, but really what they meant was that a process of death would start. And okay, I, I don't even disagree with that, but I don't believe that's what God was saying. I believe, I believe God said, you don't die that day. You eat of this tree. You don't die. And then, it didn't seem to be very long before they ate of the tree, and immediately God showed mercy. Immediately. Always remember that it's the disposition of God to redeem. God would rather forgive you than punish you. He's not willing that anybody perish. God's, your enemies are not God's enemies. And the folk that we abhor, God doesn't abhor. But the scripture makes it very clear that the sin is to die. Paul said the wages of sin is death. Show up at the place of business and here's your first day on the job. You say, uh, yeah, where do we get paid? <laughs> where do you get paid after you've been here a while? <laughs> because you've got to build up wages. See, you've been storing up wages in your life. And I've been storing up wages that we're going to get paid for one day. What's the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. Now, in the ultimate sense, that's the second death that we talked about last week. But you can see that the wages of sin is death every time you look in the mirror. Sometimes I think about myself, and I think, where did that guy go? <laughs> 
He's, he's not even here now. I always think of myself looking the same as I always have. I know it's not true. The wages of sin, death is taking a toll on you every day that you live. Paul said in the first part of the book of Romans, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. A spiritual principle is if you don't acknowledge what you know about God and demonstrate a thankful heart to God for what you do understand, then more darkness enters your life. Because you're not taking advantage of the light that you have. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, in other words, because of that, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. If you don't believe God is who he says he is, then why would you do what he says? There's not one area of life that people feel more out of control than in the area of sexual morality. And because people think they're out of control, they don't think they can do anything about it, and therefore, no preacher, no society, no government should have anything to say about what they do because they're out of control. God has plenty to say about what we do. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. One of the well-known newscasters on television said within the last couple of weeks, he said, well, Jesus wasn't perfect. He even said he wasn't. Now, a person may say, I'm a Christian. They probably wouldn't do that. They'd probably say, I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a, I'm a you know, Protestant or something, depending on. But you don't believe Jesus is sinless. You don't believe in the right Jesus. Amen. That is a cardinal biblical truth. You cannot deny and be a Christian. This type of thing is very common. People have exchanged the truth of God that they have known or at least had contact with for a lie. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. People will say, well, I don't really feel guilty about it. The reason is because God gave you over to it. And when you do what you want to do, the Holy Spirit's not convicting anymore. God's not speaking in your heart. Of course you don't feel guilty. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in their cells the due penalty of their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. How many of you have said at some point, they're talking about things in elementary school I didn't know about till I got married? They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death they not only continue to do these very things, 
but also approve of those who practice them. This world will not be your enemy for being spiritual. It will be your adversary and enemy for being a Christian. And so on the talk show, the host will say, do you consider yourself a spiritual person? Oh, I'm a, I'm a very spiritual person. This world approves of that. But not Jesus. Not the biblical Jesus. Scripture is replete with the message that sin is death. That Jesus died in your place. He died for you. Peter said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Paul said, God has made him to be sin for us who had no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some of you have seen the little track that's got the picture of Jesus died on the cross, a bunch of people standing around that are contemporary people as far as the dress is concerned, they're different races and different ages though and and when I'm using that track with someone I say, see these people standing around at the foot of the cross, they participate in Jesus' death. And you see in the background there where it looks like a bunch of clouds, it's just kind of dark and everything. That's that's a big crowd of people. And I'm back there. And so are you. Jesus died in our place. And his blood satisfies. It is God's will that you and I become the righteousness of God. Now, some of this you can accomplish. If you live for Christ, it won't be perfection, but you can be doing things that please God. As a believer, that's what we all need to be doing. But there's some of this we can accomplish because we can forgive our sins. We don't have enough merit to uh, correct all of our wrongs in the sight of God. And so part of what being what God wants us to be, his righteousness, part of it's done by Jesus, and then we try as believers in him to approximate what the scripture says is righteousness and pleases God. Isaiah spoke of the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation 21, John said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Through the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. Let's pray. Scripture says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
There's folks you know have things in their past which are not right. That's what Jesus' death is for, to wash away those sins. Those you least suspect will give their life to Christ because it doesn't matter the lifestyle the person's been involved in. They can become a child of God because the blood of Jesus satisfies the wrath of God against our sins. Jesus gave his life so that we could become the righteousness of God. There will come a day when God will make everything new. And he will dwell with those who have confessed him, repented of their sins, and followed him in life. He will be their God. They will be his children. Is your name written there in the Lamb's Book of Life? Today we recognize that the deeds of our lives have fallen short of the righteousness of God. Do we repent of those this morning? Beg the blood of Christ to cover those sins. If we confess our sins, He'll forgive our sins. None of you have ever done it. It's more important. We're stronger than what Jesus did for you on the cross. Father, today I pray for each one who's reaching out to you, Father. Would you grant forgiveness of sins and strength to live a new life, solutions to the difficulty, healing to the hurt? Father, we are so grateful presence, sweet Holy Spirit, and sacrifice of Jesus. Touch the one who's calling out for, to you in faith just now for the very first time. Once again, Father, we thank you for your presence and the opportunity we have to be in your house today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm delighted to